Welcome to Evangelistic Outreach Ministries. The fields are white, all ready to harvest. For over half a century, the Evangelistic Outreach team has traveled across the street, about the nation, and around the world with the gospel message. We're dedicated to the vision of our late founder, Dr. Calvin Evans, to reach the unreached for Jesus Christ. May the love of Christ touch you, and may His Word teach you today on Evangelistic Outreach. Well, it's wonderful to have you tuned into the program today. It's always a great time to be able to worship together with you, and we thank God for His blessings on the ministry. And this is a special weekend. I know it's a time when we reflect back with great memories on those that have served our country, those that have died in the service of our country, and the memorial that we have to our loved ones that have passed on and that are with the Lord as well. Let's look to the Lord in prayer together. Father, I thank you so much that in times like these as we reflect on the lives of those that we have loved and the lives of those that have gone on before you, we can rejoice in the fact that because you died, Jesus, and rose from the grave, you've given to us that believe in you a hope that reaches beyond all of the sorrow, the hope that we know that we'll live with you forever and be reunited with those who are there in your presence already. For to be absent from this body, you've assured us, is to be present with you. So Lord, I thank you for your nearness today. I pray that you'll bless the program, that it will encourage lives. I think of those that I've heard from just this week, so many that are shut in and unable to get to church, and they have taken the time to let us know that they're encouraged and strengthened by the program. So bless the songs today. Bless the message as it goes out. For everything that you do, I'll thank you for it. I ask it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Three teens were arrested today for defacing the Kensington Park War Memorial overnight. The destruction includes painted messages against the military and the war in the Middle East. The three teens were picked up in the early morning Where, hours after evidence was left at the scene. Grandpa, something wrong? Some people sure have short memories, and those who are too young to know need to be taught. Come on, I, I want to show you guys something. to defy gravity. To honor my family, I lived in the belly of a beast. I fixed the hearts of iron monsters. I became a worm in the mud for dignity, for honor, for righteousness sake, for God and country. I fought for you. I fought for you. For you. I fought for you. I fought for you. I fought for you. I fought for you, for you, for you, for you, for you. I fought for you. I fought for you. I fought for you, and I do it again.
2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. I'm going to do a little differently tonight and a little different kind of a message than I've been attempting to preach night after night. Uh, you know, uh, I was looking in the book of Acts today and I was reminded again, I've done this other times, but I don't do it too often. And uh, the Apostle Paul, you remember, we have several of his sermons recorded in the book of Acts. And he had the opportunity to preach to King Agrippa. And uh, I've read that message many times, the message where he told the king that he was not disobedient to his heavenly vision. But if you look at that message closely, Paul is in reality just simply giving his personal testimony. And that's what I'm going to attempt to do tonight. You know, I believe that's the greatest sermon that any of us can ever preach. It just simply say what the Lord has done for us. So if I'd have a theme tonight or a text, it would be what Christ has done for me. I don't know what he's done for you, but I know what he's done for me. I don't know what he means to you, but I know what he means to me. I don't know how you have to lean on him day after day, but I know I have to lean on him day after day. I don't know what you do when burdens come and trials come and heartaches come and frustrations come, but I know what I do in those hours when I have to go to the Lord. I'm talking about one tonight you can have a personal experience with. One you can walk with day in and day out and know you're his and he's yours. I'm talking about an experience and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now a lot of people don't know what this is. But I want to tell you tonight, I'm not talking about a ritual. I'm not talking about a ceremony. I'm not talking about some denomination. I'm talking about your personal encounter with Jesus Christ and your relationship with him. Now the name over the church door is not nearly as important as what I'm talking about. You see, you can go to church a lifetime in anybody's church with any kind of a name on it and still not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not the church that saves, it's Christ that saves. So I hope you get clear on that tonight and I just simply want to mention a few things that he's done for me. Notice the Bible says that when I read in this a moment ago, he became, uh, the Bible says that, that he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. So first of all, Jesus was, became poor that I could be made rich. And I thank God for that tonight. Did you know he was made sin that I could be made righteous? I could not be righteous in God's sight until Jesus came and died on the cross because I could not reach the goal that God had laid down for me. The Bible says, according to the law, that all were guilty. And unless uh, the, the one scripture says, he that keepeth the whole law yet offend in one point. He is guilty of all. But I thank God Jesus came and he, the law tried him, but it couldn't find him guilty. And he suffered for me and died for me. And now I can stand in his righteousness. So through the Bible said he was literally made sin. He became unclothed or was made naked that I could be clothed. Thank God. Uh, you know, the, they, they cast lots for his garments. And as he hung on the cross, he not only hung there in pain, but he hung there in shame. But I want to tell you, thank God he became unclothed that I could wear a robe of righteousness and the garments of salvation. He became an outcast that I might become a child. Did you know Jesus came to his own, the Bible says, and his own received him not. Did you know in the hometown where he grew up, he tried to preach in the, in the temple and, and they said, why, this is a carpenter's son and they were going to do away with him and they didn't want him there. When he went to the coast of Gadara, they prayed that he would depart from their coast. But thank God, I'm glad he was willing to do all of that and become a, a, an outcast in the eyes of the world that I could become a child of God. And not only that, he became a servant that I could become a child. All of these things, we could go on and on. There's a line of things I could talk about. Did you know we were aliens to the commonwealth of Israel? We were strangers to the covenant of promise. We were lost and without hope, without God in this world. But thank God, he became an outcast 
that I might be adopted into the family of God. Praise his whole, I once was an outcast, a stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. But I've been adopted, my name's written down. I'm an heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown. What are you saying, Brother Evans? Thank God I'm a child of the King. I hope you are tonight. And if you're not, it's my prayer that you will be before you leave this service. And if you're watching the television tonight, I pray that God will touch your heart and life right there where you are. So I'm glad tonight this thing is real and we can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He became poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. I think I know a little bit what it is to be poor. I'm going to say some things tonight that some of you folks will not relate to. You won't even know what I'm talking about. But some of you will know. Some of you have been there where, where I have been. We go to Jamaica and we go to these other countries. And they come to me once in a while and say, Brother Evans, I'm embarrassed to be so poor. Sometimes it is an embarrassment. But I want to tell you, I thank God for those days and years that I went through that I can look back on now and be thankful tonight Amen. of what God has done for me. I grew up on a little hillside farm. Dad was a truck gardener. I know what it is to plow ground with a cutter stalk plow. Anybody here ever do that? I want to tell you, you get on a hillside farm and you start plowing up those grape vines and green briars with a cutter stalk plow with a one horse or a mule and you let that thing hit a root and that plow handle take you in the ribs. You follow that horse for about a half a day and I guarantee you, you'll know whether or not you've got religion. <laughs> It'll try you. If you can make it through a day plowing with a cutter stalk plow, then, then, the, then you got pretty good stuff. I remember one of my first jobs when I was growing up as a boy, just a teenager, I got up at 4.30 every morning, that was one of my chores, to go hang a lantern in the chicken house. Dad found out if you'd make the chickens day longer, you'd get more eggs. That's right. We didn't have electricity. So I'd carry a lantern to the chicken house and hang the lantern up and the egg production would go up and that meant more food on the table. And food was important at that time because you didn't have much to go on. I didn't know what it was to go to a store and buy a piece of candy. You had blackberry pie or rhubarb pie or, or that, that was your sweet things. And mom, bless her heart, she's not here tonight. She's been with me three or four nights. I've been meaning to acknowledge her every night and I don't think she's here tonight. But we'd have beans and potatoes every meal. She learned how to fix beans and potatoes every different way you could fix them to make them taste a little different. Any of you know where I'm coming from? I went to school in a one room schoolhouse. I was in a two room one or two years. I got two pairs of bib overalls, two blue denim shirts, and one pair of shoes when we started school in September. And they had to last till May. Now in order to do that, I was just like any other boy. I was just out there doing everything. And mom, I've seen her many times, bless her heart, put patches on the patches on the patches to get it through to the next year. Jesus became poor. I knew when it was a treat to get a loaf of light, we called it light bread. Yeah, there was biscuits, there was cornbread, then there was shanty bread, then there was light bread. If you had a slice of light bread from a grocery store, you was eating high on the hog. I remember dad would make candy, homemade candy at Christmas time, and we'd have candy once a year. And it was a treat to have something sweet. I had to borrow a suit to graduate from high school. I'd never owned a suit. I've slept on the bed many a night. 
and you'd wake up the next morning and be snow on the bed. We lived in a log house. And you know how we built the house? One day we had a house raising. Friends and neighbors came from all over, raised those logs and built the house in a day. I tell you what, you didn't have any money then. You didn't have much to go on, but one thing you had, and that was good neighbors. I'm talking about how far we've traveled the last 40 or 50 years. We didn't know what it was to have running water. We had a, we called a water bucket, a 10 quart galvanized pail with a long handle dipper in it. And I've gone many times to get a drink of water and the dipper be frozen in the water bucket. You know where I'm coming from? We had a fireplace. We'd cut wood all winter, all, all summer in our spare time to have enough wood to burn all winter. And the fireplace then was just a big straight smoke stack going up. And all you got was just a little bit of fire in front when you got right up against it. It burned you on one side, but the other side would be freezing. <laughs> Many a time I've seen the wind blow and that old linoleum raise when it would blow. I went one entire winter once. I never even saw my father. He worked seven days a week. Bless his heart. He's in heaven now. Hauling wood to fire kills with, cutting, we call it paper wood now. He'd leave about five o'clock in the morning before I'd get up, get in about nine or 10 that night after I'd go to bed. I'd go days in and days out I'd never seen. Working 12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week. But you know, I learned something. I learned how to work. And I've never forgotten it. You know, it was this kind of times and these kind of necessities. And it was, I was just one of, I, you know, I didn't know I was poor because I wasn't poor. Everybody around me was poor. Of course, even the poor folks called us poor. I, I was a little lower than some of them. My brother was, has sung two or three nights here in this meeting. He and I would go hide in a corner of a school lot to eat our lunch because the other children would laugh at us. We didn't have light bread. We had biscuits. Took it in an eight-pound lard bucket. Couldn't buy, couldn't buy a, a lunch pail. I was a teenager before I ever tasted my first hamburger out of a restaurant. You can imagine now what a time I have pushing them back when I go down to Hickey's. <laughs> and you know what I thought of as a teenage boy? I said, when I get big, one of these days, sometime, when I, get, I become a man, I'm going to buy all the hamburgers I can eat. I was 16 years old. The summer I was 16, Dad, as I said, was a truck gardener. Tomatoes was the main crop. And he'd start working those about March, and of course they didn't come on until about July. That meant three or four months there wasn't any payday coming in. And I'd cut paper wood or, or wood to burn charcoal with a double bit of axe. You didn't have a power saw. You cut it down with an axe and chop it up with an axe. And I'd keep her family those three or four months an income coming in while dad could get the crop raised. But you know then, I graduated. I went to work. Got a good job in an industrial plant. Got married. And I had one determination. I'm going to give my children those things that I didn't have. I'm going to make money. So I started working. And in addition to that, I started playing music in a nightclub with a band. So I'd work all day at the plant and play music four nights a week in a nightclub in Huntington, West Virginia. I was making money. But it wasn't very long till I began doing the drinking. My marriage got in trouble. 
had two, two kids, two children. They'd wake up in the night and say, where's daddy? She'd say, I don't know. Our marriage was on the rocks. But then my grandfather died. And I spent the last night with him in a hospital. And he said, Calvin, call all the family in. I want to speak to them one more time. I'm going across the river. I said, oh, Dad, you're going to be all right. He said, no, I'm all right. But he said, I'm leaving. I'd like to say goodbye to them. And he looked up at me and said, Calvin, I'm just going to be over there waiting for you. Get saved and get right with God. He left this world with a testimony. That funeral, the preacher preached right at me. And I realized then the answer wasn't in making money. The answer wasn't in getting things. Things did not satisfy. I realized my life was empty. And we started sending Sharon to Sunday school with her grandmother. And little by little, we started thinking about what we're going to do with our life. Finally, one night, a big revival was going on at Sugar Creek Baptist Church. Been, folks being saved by the scores. Doris said, I don't know about you, Calvin. I know you have to go to the club tonight. But she said, I'm going to church. She said, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to send Sharon anymore to Sunday school with your mother, with her grandmother. I'm going to take her. I know something is wrong with our life. I don't know about you. But she said, I'm going to try to get right with God and give these kids a Christian mommy. She went. I went on to the club. But that night, about one o'clock in the morning, I began to whisper a prayer to God in that dance stand. And I said, Lord, if you'll get me out of here tonight, I'll never be back. I prayed all the next day. I don't suppose I eat one solid meal in those two days. Then it came Sunday. And I had a talk with Dad. I always talked things over with Dad. He was unsaved too. He'd never been a Christian, even though he was a good moral man. I said, Dad, I don't think I'll go back to church tonight. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And every night the haystack gets bigger and the needle gets smaller. I don't know what's wrong, but I said, I just think I won't go back. He said, oh, you ought to go back. I said, what do you care for? You're not a Christian. He said, oh, but, but uh, you, you should go. Well, I did go. And thank God when I reached my end. I said, Lord, I can't pray anymore, can't do anymore. I'm yours. Well, thank you for joining us today, and we certainly hope the program has been a blessing to you as we remember those that have died in the service of our country and those that have went on to be with the Lord. We're so thankful for the hope that we have in heaven today, and I ask that you would continue to remember this ministry, and uh, we'll be here again next week at this same time over this same station, and we know that uh, without the Lord, we cannot make it. So today, my friend, if you don't know him as your personal Savior, please call upon his name and make this the best day of your life by accepting him into your heart. And if you've done that, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you today. May God bless you until next week is our prayer. Dear Dad, after all these years, I've never stopped writing. I still remember many of the letters I've written you and the moments I wish you could have seen. Dear Daddy, I'm sad you had to leave, but I'm trying real hard to remember that you told me you'll always love me and to write you all the time. I didn't want you to go, but you pulled me close and hugged me tight and you said that some things are worth fighting for. Dear Daddy, I learned how to roller skate today. You'd be so proud. I fell down sometimes and skinned my knees, so I tried again and again. 
I was brave just like you. Hey Dad, sorry I haven't ridden in a while. I'm 14 today, can you believe it? Don't worry though, no boyfriends. Mom and I are doing well. Sometimes we get lonely, but it's not too bad. Dear Dad, high school graduation. I really wish you were here today. College is just around the corner. I'm staying close to home though. I figured you'd want me to help keep an eye on Mom. Dear Dad, today I married the man of my dreams. He reminds me of you. He's gentle yet strong. He loves serving me and he can make me laugh all the time, just like you could. Granddaddy went ahead and walked me down the aisle said that you'd be proud of me. It was a wonderful day seeing so many friends. We talked about you a lot and how we wished you were here. Oh, Daddy, I love coming to visit you. This time, I brought someone else, your granddaughter. I tell her about you all the time. We talk about the letters I write you and that maybe she can write you too someday. Yesterday, she told me she'd love to meet you. So I pulled her close hugged her tight and told her about how some things in this world are worth fighting for, even dying for. Love always, your daughter. For more information about this ministry, contact us at Evangelistic Outreach Ministries, 299 Ohio Avenue, New Boston, Ohio, 45662, or toll free at 800-767-8713. You can also visit us online at calvinevans.org.